So we're gonna start off making some connections. We know that schools assess their systems so that they're able to gauge whether these practices are in place um, and if they're being implemented the way that they're intended, right? It's a sort of a roadmap. So here are some TFI like roadmap pins that we can make some strong connections to uh, throughout today's content. Okay, so just a little bit of setup. When we think about classroom behavioral practices, here are some quotes. And it's really moving past just compliance-based types of expectations and teaching, moving towards a more holistic approach, a more ecological approach, where we are preparing our students through their learning process, right? And we are supporting them in regulating their emotions, okay? So this is a shift that we are making at that classroom level that we really wanna be conscious of. So I'm about to share a graphic that has a lot of words. So know that um, hopefully you got a handout um, and it looks something like this. And the graphic is that colored graphic on, the, on one of the sides. If you didn't, it is in the uh, session materials, online, on the app, et cetera, okay? I'm gonna walk through the spirit of this document and um, really the role that it could play as an example for um, other places, other schools or districts. So when we think about what tier one universal systemic practices live in the classroom level, that can be a bit abstract, okay? If teams were uh, trained about five, seven, 10 years ago, this wouldn't have made it into the tier one training materials. So really we need to re-examine the way we support uh, classrooms. Some schools have figured it out, some districts have figured it out, but some haven't yet, right? So we're really thinking about how do we support our educators at the classroom. So let's think. In the classroom, what are the things that we do that are proactive, right? These pieces need to be in place so that our students can be successful. Yes, we start on day one, but this is ongoing. There are proactive strategies. So Michelle is going to be walking through this first column. It is so important that we have them in place, right? Before we have conversations around responding to behavioral error, right? We will need to respond to behavioral error. That is natural, that is normal. But yet, what are the proactive pieces that we have in place so that we are minimizing that throughout the year with our students? This document goes on to layer in possible responses. And remember, this is universal tier one, okay? So we're not thinking of chronic serious behaviors quite yet. We're thinking about, we're just noticing minor behavioral patterns. What are the responses that we're gonna have as a classroom teacher to those patterns? There are some reminders in this document around family, um, family role, the, the fact that families are experts on uh, their children, our students, so we partner. We make sure that they're part of this process. Not just the response process, right? The proactive process. And if these pieces are in place and um, used at fidelity, the goal is that they, that 85 to 90% of students are responding to those practices. If that's not happening, we take a look at the practices, right? There's an option to layer on. I'm not gonna walk box by box. This is an example of how we can lay out clearly for our classrooms, systemically, systemically for all classrooms, what it is that we do as a school, right? And then there are some reflection pieces. As reflective practitioners, we need to really think about and analyze some of these behavioral errors that we see happening when they do pop up, right? And consider our proactive pieces and re refine and uh, response and layer. And yes, there's a time and place for possible documentation, possible use of a T-chart, but let's be honest, that is now a reactive document. The behaviors are, have already appeared, right? This is more of a proactive approach. This is where we wanna start. 
Okay. So we offer this as an example of something that can clearly be laid out for classroom teachers, support classroom teachers in these practices using a team-based approach. So Michelle's going to dig into that first column for us. Okay. Good morning. Um, thanks for being here. Um, as Yuli said, I'm going to talk about that very first column, that proactive piece, because we do know that it's so important. And I just wanted to point out that um, as you think about this document and you start taking notes, we provided you a graphic organizer around the five steps, and be thinking about what are some of the things that you already do that fit into these categories. And when you're listening to our exemplar school, Badger Elementary, be listening for the things where you see how they fit what they do into this kind of frame for how we respond to student behaviors, how we set them up for good behavior and how we set them up for relationships and how we set them up for responding to behavior in a way that is um, not punitive, but more teaching. Um, so <clears throat> just to cue you up on that, um, as Yuli said, they're proactive in nature, and we're really thinking about operationalizing. So some of, the, some of the pieces in here are kind of broad. So it's up to you to operationalize. Like, what does that look like? What are we going to stop doing? And what are we going to start doing instead? So you really have to think about the system and how that's going to roll out. You can't just say, we're doing this now. Um, be thinking about being really planful. And you'll hear more about that from Badger, too. <coughs> so common set of practices used systemically, it needs to be predictable for students, and it also needs to be something that staff can count on each other to be doing, so there's that, that community spirit of this is how we do business. So step one, um, relationships. We don't want to think about PBIS as being just compliance. So the way that these five steps are set up for you is you could actually take these five slides and use them for a staff development and help your staff figure out some, like I can walk out of here and do this today. Like I did an in-service where staff walked out and they had some things that they could go do with their students when the students came. It was a late, it was a late start day. Um, so each one is set up with some ideas. And then where you see the, um, the hyperlinks, you're going to have either resources or videos that you can click on that actually show the practice in action. So the first one, a simple, small thing, is to have everyone commit to that good morning procedure. How are you welcoming your students into your class? Everyone is greeting the student by name making them feel like they matter, and learning at least one thing about the student that doesn't have anything to do with school. And you'll find that as you get to know students better in those out of school kind of conversations, the more likely they are to think that, hey, this teacher cares about me. <laughs> I feel like I'm part of this community. Um, so <clears throat> the morning handshake video, I highly encourage you to watch that one. The man is so, he's like a fourth grade teacher, I think, or fifth grade teacher, and he's so energetic. He created an individualized handshake with each of his students as they're coming in the room. Now, I'm not suggesting we all create a handshake, but have something that feels personal to you and that helps your students like, feel like this is genuine. Um, for families, setting up that welcoming environment right from day one and doing some getting to know you kinds of conferencing rather than um, these are our procedures, these are our rules, here's the you know, family handbook, this is what PBIS is. Um, really learning more about who it is that you serve. Once you know who it is that you're serving, then you can customize how you reach out to families and find out things like, how do you want to be contacted? Um, how can you contact me? What kinds of things can I contact you for? What would you like me to, you know, how would you like me to communicate those things? So that they feel like they have a voice, but also the contact isn't always going to be something scary. Um, 
One of the uh, resources on here is that two by 10 relationships. And um, that is one of those strategies that if you are having a student that's really, it's harder for you to connect with them for whatever reason. Um, we have affinities to some students more so than others. What did I just do? Oh, okay. Um, so two minutes for 10 days, have conversation with the student, finding out more about things outside of school. And the research shows that you're going to see behaviors turn around. You're going to see um, more um, interest and engagement in learning. Next. Examine your classroom matrix. Does it have compliance behaviors listed on there, or is it about your routines and your procedures? Is it really the skills that you want your students to have? What are the things that you're noticing, um, social, emotional, um, college career readiness kinds of behaviors um, that you want your students to have that currently are not represented in your matrix? And develop it with your students. So you can have your own ideas about some of those things, but then ask the students, what does this look like? What does this sound like? And revisit it. It's, it's like your anchor chart. And then you can, ref, you, know, you can refer to it. You can pick things out and prompt kids. You know, remember, during this time of entering the classroom, um, here are some things I'm going to be looking for and then thanking them for it. So it, it, you're going to use it to prompt, teach, practice, to fluency. Um, which is my next point, teaching to fluency. For some reason, when we first started training in PBIS, we taught, um, you know, have the rodeo in the beginning of the year, and then we kind of left classroom out of it. But one of the things that we have kind of pushed is don't start talking about minors and recording that data about minor behavior problems until you're about four to six weeks in. And the reason why is because students haven't had an opportunity to practice to fluency. And you can see from that um, continuum that you're gonna teach a new skill and then they're gonna learn it with accuracy, just like they would with reading or some math skill. And then they become fluent after they practice and then they can start to generalize it to other situations and you know have more of a skill maintained. So we often forget that behavior is just like, or social skills are just like any other skill. It takes time to learn them, and just because you taught it once doesn't mean that it sticks. And then our students who have learning disabilities, if it takes them longer to learn something academic, it's gonna take them longer to learn something social, potentially. So just kind of have that awareness and looking at your data, seeing like when we disaggregate R, are students with disabilities performing at a lower level? Are we writing up more um, minors in the classroom for that? Um, and then be responsive. Um, feedback. So when you look at your classroom matrix that you have developed with your students, that you have talked about with your other um, job alikes in your school, so you know, Sixth grade teachers, put your heads together. Are we having some of the same expectations and, and experiences with our students? So now let's think about on those, which ones are my quote pet peeps? In other words, which ones am I reminding kids all the time to do? So I should assume A, they're not fluent, or B, I haven't reinforced it so that it sticks. So we wanna make sure that we provide that feedback um, in a way that helps them learn it and know that you appreciate or that you notice that it's happening, but also so that they can internalize that they are actually capable of whatever it is you want them to do. So what I say to staff is, think about one or two of those scenarios that kind of drive you wild. <laughs> they may be forgetting their materials, they don't have their pencils, um, they're touching everybody on their way in. Um, you know what I'm talking about, those 10th graders. Um, <laughs> so think about that, they test your patience. And then you can start to think about, in my own words, how am I going to remind my students and pre-correct or prompt for what I'm looking for? And then how can I take those same statements and turn them into a positive specific praise statement? So we're not just handing out tickets, good job, 
we're actually handing out a ticket or a token um, or not um, and using that really specific positive language that helps them know exactly what it was that they did that was correct. Um, then plan what are your intentions to use it. So it's not enough to just write it down. Now you got to be thinking about, okay, so how am I going to structure this into my day? The last piece is correction. And it should always result in learning. And we're so used to thinking about correction behaviorally as being some kind of negative consequence where it really needs to result in a change in behavior and a change in behavior comes from learning. So taking those same um, kind of thinking around academics, if a student was making reading errors, math errors, um, how they thought about something that they were learning in social studies, how do you provide that correction? What kinds of words are you using? Can you insert a social skill or a behavioral skill in place with the same kind of emotion or lack of emotion, right, um, to provide that correction? And can you write some of those corrective statements out to practice them, to think about how that would sound and what your tone and your facial expressions are going to be? And then think about this. If I provide correction for an academic error and they do it correctly, do I get excited? Do I praise them? Mm -hmm. Do you do it for behavior? Or is it, well, they should have been doing it anyway. Why should I turn around and praise them now? You need to praise it, just like you would with academics. It's still learning. And they're kids, you know? So we got to take that attitude. Um, so those are the five steps. It's kind of simplistic, but if you can take your staff through some kind of activity like this and then challenge them to do it systemically, um, you can measure the results. So pick some data points and encourage them to hold each other accountable to doing it in a really systemic way. Awesome. So we just want to point out that um, in the handout on the other side is a graphic organizer. <laughs> course, um, that has team trained support. Um, it has some descriptors of what we mean by that. Um, and this uh, popped up in the keynote this morning as well, right? This um, kind of way of thinking of uh, teams supporting teachers, right? So how does the team build their own capacity in these practices? Um, how, are those, how are those teams identifying what those practices are? how are we going to build relationships strategically in all of our classrooms, right? And there's that equity piece, right? All of our classrooms, so that all of our students have access and opportunities to these great practices, right? So that's where the team piece lives, train. So the team then trains staff. And that, that might be a little bit of a different messaging that we've heard in the past, right? It's, re it's really this leadership role that the team takes on and um, training and then ongoing support, of course, right? That ongoing support is really what's going to make or break some of those practices, right, that we're putting into place. Um, so we um, have that organizer organized as such. And then at the very top, you'll see in the row um, those five concepts of how do we build relationships with families um, and students? How do we set our expectations? How do we teach? How do we give specific positive feedback, et cetera. So we invite you to um, listen to Badger Elementary um, share their story of the specific practices they, they put into place to be proactive around behavior and um, try to identify and see where those pieces are living. All right, so with that, we are going to welcome our two presenters. Come on over. Oh, there's a lot of you out here. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, my name is Amanda Patza. I'm a dean of students at Badger Elementary. That position has been in place for two years. Um, so I recently was hired this past year. So this is my first complete year I would have at Badger. 
and my name is Molly Pakwinski, and this will be my eighth year teaching at Badger Elementary. Before that, I worked part-time as a substitute teacher for about seven years while I was home with my own children, so. All right, Whoop. Yep. too far. All right, so to help you understand our defined makeup um, of our school and our community that we serve, we just wanted to give you a little background on our school uh, to help ground you in what we're looking at. So we are a K-6 Title I school. We have 360 students enrolled. We are a very transient school. So last year alone, we had 44 students that moved in. And then we also had 40 students that moved out. And then you can take a look at our demographic there. We also um, have special education that serves LD, EBD. Um, we have a speech and language pathologist. And um, we also have ELL in our building. So taking a look at our um, history and how long we've been implementing PBIS, uh, we've been 10 years universal, uh, five years tier two, and then three years with a tier three system in place. Um, taking a look at our office discipline referrals um, for the 2017-18 school year, we had 783 total office discipline referrals, and then you can take a look at our suspension data as well. So as we looked, especially at our TFI and our SAS data, one thing that was coming up often was just that staff was feeling like if a problem behavior was occurring, they couldn't keep teaching. They didn't know what to do. And we felt like as a team, we really needed to problem solve that because the solution was just to continue to send students down to the office and then the problem behavior would magically go away, which it wouldn't, in the classroom. So when we sat down to problem solve last summer, that was one of our big focuses, was how could we help the staff feel better about this. So just grounding ourselves in some of that data as well, when we think of that RTI um, triangle that we're looking at, we're really not matching up from our data from the 2017-18 school year. Really ideally in that tier one we should have between 80 and 90 percent. Our tier two should be between 5 percent and 15 percent and then our tier three should only be between one and five. So looking at our data triangle did not look good. So we knew we needed to do something in response to that data. Um, and really, once we dug into the data even further, we noticed that there was some great inequities with our special education students. Um, that when it came to addressing those uh, behaviors with students with disabilities, we really were not um, functioning well. So we needed to look at that data triangle and re-educate not only our staff, um, but re-evaluate our process when we're writing up those students with disabilities. So we identified from our data that our biggest problem behaviors were physical aggression, defiance, and fighting. And we also really looked at how staff was responding to that, which was typically a conversation of the adult talking and the student listening and not much reteaching. So we felt like we needed to give our staff tools to really change how we were responding to these behaviors. So what we did as a team is we really um, talked about a number of different things. We looked at our overall system and how that was working. Um, and when we thought about our PBIS implementation as a building level, really we looked at having between 5 and 15% of our staff members that were involved in PBIS, which was voluntary for them. They decided that this was the silo they really kind of wanted to take some ownership in. And then we also had a literacy team and a math team. And we thought to ourselves, that what would be a more productive use of our time is to create a school climate team. And that's what we implemented this past school year. So we had three different subcommittees that staff had an opportunity to be a part of. And each subcommittee, one would be family engagement, a second would be acknowledgements, and then lastly would be like our roundups. Um, we implement second step or as some reteaching tools for social and emotional learning, um, which we found really effective because instead of having these individual silos, 
it really gave staff ownership in PBIS and being able to take into account and kind of, um, I'm trying to think of how I would like to word it, like killing two birds in one stone, with one stone, so to speak, with certain events. Like we have literacy nights and instead of all of that being placed on just literacy, that can also be factored into our family engagement section as well. Um, we also had a lot of PD that we encouraged staff to go to and we did some in-house PD. One thing we started was we felt like at the beginning of the year when we were welcoming back staff and rolling out all of our PBIS stuff, we had changes, but then we also had stuff we weren't changing and the entire staff didn't need to sit through it. So we started hosting a lunch for our new staff and really breaking down the basics of our PBIS and what we do and allowing them to ask us questions in a smaller setting. And we've had a really good response to that, just feeling more comfortable that they weren't sitting with the whole staff hearing about all of our PBIS, but maybe 10 of us sitting down and talking. Yeah, and also to really to try to address some of those inequities with our special education population. Um, we've infused inclusion planning. So once a month, our special education um, staff would be able to meet with regular education staff and we would provide subs. So they were able to collaborate with them to best suit the needs of those students, which we have found to be very powerful. Mm -hmm. I know Molly can speak to that as well because she yeah. has been a part of that process. Yeah, and as a classroom teacher this last year, I had six students with IEPs, so I did find it very beneficial. The day gets really busy, you don't have time to sit down and talk. So just knowing once a month we could problem solve either academics or behaviors was very, very helpful to just have that time set aside as a school. And we really increased collaboration all around as well. Like every, um, bi-monthly, I would meet with our uh, para support and we would talk about uh, new things that have been addressed. What does our data look like? What can I do to help best support them? And some of our best ideas came out of all of those collaboration opportunities. And then you can see as well that we've had some professional development available for staff. Um, we had the opportunity to go see Ross Green, which is an amazing speaker. Um, we also did the book study Lost at School around there. And then we'll touch a little bit more on restorative practices and restorative circles that we um, implemented this past year. So going back to that three subcommittee um, framework that we started with school climate, one thing that we noticed is that we're really powerful and it's so powerful to acknowledge students, but students aren't the only ones who need to be acknowledged. So do our staff. And we need to keep our staff morale up. So these are some of the things that we implemented um, throughout the year at Badger. We started our year in our kickoff with remembering your why. We reminded staff, or we just asked staff and probed them, why did you get into this teaching profession? What is your why? And then we had um, everyone write that down and post it so that it could be a reminder as to their why. Uh, we also did a staff shout outs where staff could give a recognition to one another for something that they did um, that was helpful to them or to a student. And then we also did a bingo board. So this was located in our office. And then on our bingo board, we had various things on there that we would like to see staff doing. So I handed out 10 bulldogs. We were the Badger Bulldogs. Um, I collaborated with a team member. I attended a student event. Um, all, different site, all different sorts of desired behaviors we'd like to see from staff. It was interesting to see as we started as a staff, like even the shout outs, there were a couple, but then once there were a few up there, then more people added as you saw them up there. So it was really neat to see staff buy into acknowledging each other too. And then as part of that too, our, our Phi Ed teacher um, also was able during our staff development to get in um, a fitness class for us. So that was a way for us to um, kind of bond together as a staff and build community among staff members. She ended up getting Pound Fitness to come in um, and do that with us, which was, which was fun and engaging. Oh, so some positive additions around school, one of them that you can't see. Um, so if you look here, um, believe in yourself. In our restrooms, we painted our um, stalls and then we put inspirational quotes on them for kids. So just building that school climate throughout. We also have class bulldogs that you see on the left here. So if the classroom 
was doing a great job walking in line or maybe they went to a special that those specialist teachers could recognize those students by giving them a class bulldog which we had displayed outside of the classrooms and then on Mondays we would do video announcements and at times we might recognize a classroom for having so many badger bulldog classroom classroom bulldogs um, you can see the little token there we did mystery staff members so every week we would pick two staff members could be teachers could be support staff that would have a set number of tokens two per grade level and as they were walking around the school if they saw a student exhibiting some positive behavior or desired a desired behavior throughout our school that they would hand them that token and then on Fridays in our lunchroom they would have an opportunity to come up and spin the wheel and once they spin the wheel there would be a number of different incentives on there from eating lunch with a desired staff member to a token prize um, lots of different things that they could get there and the kids really liked it they um, really did like as a classroom teacher they would not tell who that mystery staff member was if they got one they were super excited to keep it a secret and if somebody had it they'd be really like oh, I got one but I'm not telling who it is and they might catch you like it became quite a big deal if you did get one of those tokens and then lastly you can't see the photo but we did um, what we called brave awards and brave stood for uh, bulldogs respect and value everybody um, and then every month we would have once a month we would have an assembly in our gym and during that time teachers would have written a nomination for a student per grade level one per grade level and then I would get those names send home a letter to the families that says your son or daughter has been acknowledged for doing some really great things around our school we'd like to welcome you to come to this assembly where they will be recognized and the students had no idea so then during that assembly I would read aloud the nomination of that student and that student would be able to come up get acknowledged get a certificate and then we had some great community partnerships throughout Appleton where they would get like a sky zone like a trampoline park gift card and some other things to acknowledge them get them all? Mm -hmm. oh there's the picture oh there it is <laughs> so really as we're moving forward you know we all do our best with what we what we know until we know better and then we want to know then we do better so looking at um, another professional development that we implemented last year was restorative practices. So currently we had about 15 teachers that signed up for restorative practices and then 10 teachers are currently using restorative circles including Molly who will speak to what that looks like in the classroom. So some structures that we have in place that allots us that time to be able to implement some of those things we have a soft landing um, so we have a free breakfast program at our school so for the first 30 minutes of our day we do not have any academics that are slotted or specials so that students can come in and enjoy their breakfast but then we can also implement that restorative circle um, we also have monthly late starts and then we also had after school PD to, to teach teachers how to use this and then we're infusing them into our staff meetings as well to really model what that looks like and to increase our base of teachers who would be implementing that restorative practices and restorative circles. Well, so we had asked for staff members who were using it just to give different testimonials. They are, these are all on the slides, so we're not going to read them to you now. But if you would like to go back later and look at them, this is an example from one of our fifth and sixth grade teachers who has spent a lot of time setting up circles in her classroom. The next slide is from our school counselor, and she has a very long example of a situation. <laughs> but it's a really cool story of just how, instead of sending the student to the office, she did a restorative circle, and it really had a positive outcome. And then the last testimonial we have was from a, one of our special ed teachers who's just started using them this year and had not done them before. Roll, roll. Yep. <laughs> I don't know where I'm at. 
Okay. So then kind of looking at the perspective that I took and looking at building wide how this could be implemented and, and the benefits of that, this was really taught explicitly in the classroom. We had the benefit of having some external coaches that were able to come in and do the professional development within our district. Um, so basically we did two four-hour sessions of restorative practices training and then we did another two four-hour sessions of restorative circles. And then this was modeled and done throughout the classroom um, during those times that I stated um, previously. So when we're looking at this, and really what I noticed as the big shift was how students are addressing problem solving and addressing just in discipline in general. Before when students would have an issue, they would end up coming to my office and it would seem very punitive that they were getting sent to the office because it was such a negative thing. Where when we started implementing restorative circles and restorative practice and those restorative conferences, it really turned into a problem solving session and it really allowed us to get to the function of the behavior. It gave students a voice in what was happening. And one really big takeaway that we had for the staff was instead of ask, and instead of saying you did this, start out by just saying what happened? And really just giving them that opportunity to tell their side of the story, to have that conversation with them, to really get at the function of what was going on and what was that function of the behavior. Um, so how I really knew this was working was a couple of things. Um, one, a student ended up coming to me after being a part of restorative conferences several times for conflicts with peers. And at one point he came to me and said, Mrs. Patza, can I talk to you quick? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, what's going on? And he said, can you help me with this conversation I wanna have with so-and-so? I'm like, all right, well, what happened? Well, we were on Fortnite last night and it got pretty heated. <laughs> and, it, and he's like, I mean, to the point where like, we're not talking to each other and there's some things that, are, that have been said that I've really been thinking about and it's kind of been bugging me. And I thought, wow, how powerful is that? That this is such a great opportunity to have this conversation and for kids to solve those problems collectively and together so that they can focus on the academics. Because so many times they're coming back into the classroom after a recess incident or what have you, they're not ready to get back to that learning because that's all they're thinking about is the conflict that they had. So we were able to come together, have that conversation, and really restore the harm that's been done between the two of them and come to an agreement together on what that looks like moving forward. Um, so with that, this also comes with some really great benefits, but also some new issues that surfaced. And then I wanna talk a little bit about what I have more time for. So students now see, instead of that dean position, as a punitive role, but more of like, I can be an advocate for them and I can help them facilitate those conversations with hopes that they won't need me in the future, that they'll know what I'm going to prompt them to say so many times. I might ask them about what happened, how did, it, how did that affect people that you know and who had that affected? And then what have you thought about since this has occurred? And then what can we do to make this right? How can we restore the harm that's been done um, in order to move forward? So I love the fact that I'm the advocate for them. Um, and it really reduces that shame as well. Like sometimes when students get approached by behavior completely unintentionally, we could be shaming them. Um, so, and the fact that they're able to articulate their feelings and how they felt in that moment kind of goes back to that brain research too that we know that naming your feelings has beneficial effects on moving the activity from the brain from that amygdala to like the frontal cortex which is responsible for making those rational decisions. So when I'm thinking about new challenges that have surfaced, a couple of things come to mind. I also talked about how 
students might not be ready to come back to the classroom. There could have been a conflict at recess. Those two students could be in that same classroom, and they're not ready to be in that same classroom yet. And the shift that has to happen is staff members need to be aware of that and be okay with the fact that they're not going to be attending that math class, and you might not get to that academic during that period. And sometimes that's hard. That's a hard pill to swallow because as teachers, you know there's so many pressures of all the things that you need to get into your day, and having them outside of the room can be taxing. But when you think about it, they're not ready to learn anyway, and they're not in the right mindset to learn. They might be in physically in your classroom, but they're not attending to what you're teaching. Um, another issue that we've had, one thing really moving forward that I'd like to see is that instead of myself facilitating issues that are happening and having those conversations, to really put it back on the classroom teacher. If, that, if they're not practicing the, beha the desired behavior in that classroom and they're not meeting that teacher's expectation, that that teacher is taking ownership and having that conversation when it's, when, it's when it's available to do so. And that might mean me coming into the classroom to cover the classroom while they step out and have a conversation with that student. And also, um, I've had teachers that have gone through this training as well, and both the teacher and the student need to be in a good mindset to have those conversations. And at times, they're not. And I've been a part of conversations where I would be there to help facilitate, and I've asked a staff member, and I said, are you ready to have this conversation? And they said, yep, absolutely, I'm ready. And as we started the conversation, it was very evident that they were not, that it turned very punitive, and you need to listen to me because I am the adult. And at that point, we need to stop, and I need to advocate not only for the well-being of all involved and say, I think we're going to need to take a pause and come back to this conversation. So. What this really has made more time for, this problem solving, is more time for me to do some of those proactive things, to be visible in the hallways, to hand out some bulldogs, some tokens, and other, um, finding some other additional resources for staff, and connecting with our families. So now, as the classroom teacher, what I did to, I had a lot of this in place already, but just really, thinking about all the steps and how I was going to explicitly teach them in my classroom, but also just building that positive classroom environment and that classroom community. So these are some examples of things that I set up either this year or have had set up in my classroom that I also have been sharing out to staff in our, in our school to try. So the one thing is we've been shifting a lot in our school to do flexible seating. And this year I sort of took it on fully and it was amazing, just the difference it made in the learning environment in my classroom. The students had an attendance spot, so when they came in the classroom in the morning, after lunch, after recess, they went to that attendance spot. But then their work time was choice. And it took a lot of teaching at the beginning of the year and practicing and setting those routines. But once we got going, it just flowed and really worked nicely. Um, the key of the quote I'm going to talk about again in a little bit because I have a picture on another slide and the whiteboard. Um, my classroom jobs have really evolved over the year. I went in like, oh, we're going to have jobs. I'm going to change them every week. And last year and this year, I had it that they had the job for a month. They applied for the job. They wrote out reasons. It got to the point this year where I had kids writing on their application, I don't want any of these jobs. Here's a new job I think we need in the classroom. Great, so we have a new job. Um, but then their job also at the end of the month was to train the new person who took on that job. So one job was, Amanda said, we have free breakfast and, and lunch at our school and breakfast is served in our classroom. So it was a job of two students to get the breakfast set out, mark who all ate breakfast, clean it up, see if anybody needed anything. So at the end of the month, whoever had that job, they trained them and I tell them with I mean, it's hard to come up with a lot of jobs in your classroom when you have 25 to 30 students. So they're usually paired up. But I always tell them, if you don't do it, I'm not going to do it. Like, this is not my job. It's your job. And it really, they take full ownership in it then and make sure it gets done. Um, I had two students this last year with a positive point sheet. 
which was just a point sheet, but they viewed it differently. They had been on point sheets basically since kindergarten. They didn't really want to be on point sheets anymore. They had a very negative attitude about point sheets. So I started out doing just tally marks on sticky notes. Like every time I catch you doing something great, I'm just going to give you a tally. And there was just an extra incentive. And I had really great communication with their, both of their parents about it that, you know, this, they, they don't even see this as a point sheet, really, when really you're still tracking their behavior and communicating with us. And um, these two boys just really formed a bond even over it. And like their incentives were usually something at the end of the day, like 10 minutes with one of our para pros going and doing something. And they really built this nice community, also with the para pro who was taking them. So it was a new addition that I think I will continue. Um, celebrations, we fill out agendas every day, and I had been at a workshop a while ago where they said, you know, really focus on three positives for your day. I mean, things can go wrong and you can dwell on that, but focus on three positives. So in the front of our agendas, there's a calendar for each month, and so we utilize that each day of the, after we fill out our agendas, we go to the calendar and then we write down three positive things that happened that day. And it could be anything from, we got new carpet spots, to we had a guest teacher, to what we played in gym class. But if I forgot to do that, like they remembered and called me out on it that we needed to do it. And it was cool because then I had parents checking like, oh, this is a great conversation piece. You didn't just sit around and do nothing at school today. Here are three great things that happened at school today. Um, and I do really incorporate a lot of student voice into my classroom. So whether it's where they were sitting, our expectations, we create our classroom matrix together at the beginning of the year. I have in mind what I want, but a lot of times they come up with really great ideas. And I make it huge and it's posted in our room. And it's kind of a living document. As we experience things together, we make changes to it. We have another one of our fifth and sixth grade teachers. She posts it on her smart board. That's like her background is her matrix. And then she can make changes to it because it's a Google Doc, so it's really easy. Um, thing, structures that we had in place within our school and my classroom was the soft landing that Amanda talked about. I really utilize that as time to check in with students. It is hard for them to come in in the morning, and you can definitely tell, like, hood is up, or no hello at the doorway, they need an extra check-in, or I had one student who did cooking competitions this last year, so it was really nice time to ask her how it went and see what she, was, what she made and who all came. This was one of the main times I did circles in my classrooms, the restorative circles. I mostly did community building circles, and the restorative circles happened at other times. And um, our soft landing time is also a really great time for us to do our read-alouds and discussion. And that also just builds great community. And then um, another thing that I found this last year is I did a lot with inquiry. And it led to group work, which was really great in building that community. They could mix up and work with anybody in the classroom and they had no problem with it by the end of the year. So just some differences of how restorative circles and practices looked in my classroom. I really found at the beginning of the year, like September with anything, we really focused just on the expectations of it and very easy like, it was more of community circles talking about our favorite colors, our favorite foods, where we would wanna travel, but it, set the stage for when we did have to have tough conversations, they knew how to do it in the classroom. We had a really great, just one, we had a really great problem solving restorative circle with our music teacher halfway through the year. So after setting the expectations and she had not come in for a circle and I invited her in and she had a student teacher, and they were just so impressed with how the kids all shared. They all had their ideas. They respected when everybody was talking. And they really did problem solve something that was happening in music where, like Amanda said, it was important. It wasn't happening with, like, with me. And she had the music teacher had asked, can I just come in and talk to them? And I said, how about we do a circle instead? And it was really effective. 
One of the biggest things I would say if you do start doing circles is I found I had especially two or three students this year who probably didn't share anything till halfway through the year. But once they figured out that their voice was heard and what they had to share was important, then they were completely in. So just being patient with that, I always let them pass. But the students who started sharing halfway through had great things to share and they felt valued. So these are just some pictures of things I talked about. Um, or I didn't talk about, but we're on the first side. So this year I started something new called Keep the Quote. I got it off of Instagram. It was a really great idea. I kind of modified it for what I wanted to do as far as positive classroom environment, community building. And how I started it was I told the kids we're going to do the, we're going to try this. We're going to, you're going to give me quotes. We're going to post them. You're in charge of watching someone who follows the quote all week. And then you're going to acknowledge them. And I modeled it first. I put a quote up. And I told them I'm secretly watching all the other staff members in the school, and I didn't tell them. And throughout the week, I reminded them what the quote was. I reminded them what it meant to me. And it was um, really powerful because the kids started leaving me notes like, I saw Mrs. So-and-so do this. I think you should pick her. And, <laughs> and that continued. because So then at the end of the week, I called the teacher in who I chose and told her why I chose her. And... We took a picture, so you can see in the background of the picture with those two boys, I posted the pictures then as we went along. So then the next week, I put up a student's quote, and they told us on Monday what it meant to them, and all week they were watching for someone, and we had a lot of discussion. They were really worried, like, if somebody was going to pick their best friend or the same people were going to be picked. It didn't happen. Like, they were amazing with really finding somebody who followed their quote that maybe they didn't talk to hardly at all. And then we just kept posting pictures, but they continued doing the same thing. Like whoever's quote it was would be like, oh, somebody left me a note that they saw this person do this at recess. So they were all watching for it, not just the one person who had the quote up there. Another thing I started, I utilized one of my whiteboards and it was just like a shout out board, a birthday board, um, just different whiteboard, but they loved the birthday board and they kind of evolved it over the year that they didn't want it to just say happy birthday like this one just says happy birthday all over it. They wanted to write nice things about that person when it was their birthday. And then they had the discussion, was that fair to the people who already had their birthday that they didn't get nice things written about them? So they were really thinking and this all happened in circles. And then this is just kind of pictures of my classroom. We you had a break spot, so like these are break items that they could use and they could come sit back here in the library. Just some of my flexible seating. I had tables that were on the floor and um, desks and regular tables. Um, so I have to point out my graph because it goes backwards. This is the ODR data of just four of my high flyers who kind of came in this year. So this is their data from second grade, this is their data from third grade, and this is from this last year. And really just building those relationships, that positive environment, and helping them to foster that outside the classroom. Because a lot of the ODRs happen either on the playground or in specials or in the hallway. And I, so these four students really worked hard this year to try their best and work. Um, so the benefits of just establishing all this, I felt like um, the students really acknowledged each other more and it wasn't just acknowledging but they were helping each other. They like were little teachers all over the room jumping in and modeling how I was talking to the students and do you need something? How can I help you? There before I could even get there. And they really expressed their feelings. They shared things that were amazing. By the end of the year, they knew a lot about each other, but they felt comfortable that they could share that with each other. And obviously, my, I had more time. I had more time to do everything because the classroom was running differently. Some challenges, I'm also our building ISC, so I see this like whole school now too, are how to share this out. I had some teachers come in just to watch some things in my room, but how to get other people to see. And this last year, as we established changes within the school, that helped a lot. Um, and also just getting everyone involved. If something happens in on the playground, sometimes it was challenging to do a restorative circle in our my classroom 
without the adults who were part of the playground incident. So just problem solving for next year, how we can incorporate that. So this is where we ended up um, last year looking at our data. So you can see the really great encouraging improvements that we've seen just in one year. So overall our ODRs have been reduced by 59%. The ongoing collaboration with special education and re-educating staff reduced our um, students with disabilities ODRs to by 58%. And then our suspensions have been reduced by 27% as well. So really great encouraging gains moving forward. And that's all we have for you. Thank you. I'm trying to take a picture. Okay. I'll take one. All right. So we have a few minutes for some questions and answers from um, our guest speakers. And we might have some coming in from other places as well that Michelle will help out with. Are there any questions from? The audience, go for it. So the question is, um, some individuals were brought in for PD around restorative practices. Who were those individuals? <laughs> we are very fortunate that our external PBIS coaches within our district are um, trained in restorative practices. So they were able to come to our building site and do those uh, sessions with us. Yes. Great question. So a specialist is asking if specialists are brought in to the training and having these circles in their um, own classrooms as opposed to just the um, kind of more mainstream classrooms. Our vision for that is yes, that we would like to see that eventually get to that point. Um, what it has been thus far is if there's been individual cases that have been brought up where she would be or he would be able to come and facilitate a conference with me if that's individually with a student. But eventually what we'd like to see is that really core group of people who have gone through that training advocating and kind of being like our cheerleaders for we need to be doing this school-wide to get that moving. I think with our specialists, their hesitation for doing it during gym, music, or art is their time is so short that we could find, like that soft landing time is a perfect time where they don't have to miss out on. But sometimes it is crucial right during music or gym or art to do that. Thanks. A question? So what's a general kind of outline of uh, circle procedures mm -hmm. and timeline? And are we talking about community circles or restorative circles? The restorative. OK. I think that you have to establish the community circle first before you would go into a restorative circle. But in my room, the expectations were everybody came to the circle, whether you were going to talk or not. You had the option to pass. Um, all thoughts are respected and listened to. And I always told them we had a talking piece, so whoever had the talking piece could talk. Once it went all the way around again, if you had passed and you wanted to share, you were the person who got to talk first before other people did. So I think establishing that really helped because they needed to know those expectations in a, I don't know the right word I'm thinking of, but just they need that before they could move to the restorative. Um, then the circles, as far as time-wise, I mean, anywhere from 5 to 15, 20 minutes. Okay. So in other words, the proactive circle is first, then the responsive <laughs> circle. Okay, great. Um, and we have one uh, question coming in from elsewhere, from one of the seesaws. Who runs the soft landing? The classroom teacher. Okay. It, we... How many years ago? Two, three? Th so this, we just finished our third year having soft landing and 
it's really the students are all in their classrooms. Um, one day a week they're w watching like our morning announcements while they're eating breakfast. They might be listening to a, a read aloud. You, they might eat and then do a circle. We do our social skills one morning a week during that time, so we use second step. So we do that just because then we don't have to plan around specials and everything else. So the classroom teacher plans it. Any other questions? Okay, we, we do have some coming in. That gives us a little wait time for us to think too. Great question. So how are parents or families involved in um, knowing about the procedures, the restorative, the community circles? Sure. So this process is fairly new to us and that is something looking forward and setting goals for the upcoming school year that we really want to focus on is informing the families a little bit more about that, um, whether that be some sort of professional development or some sort of development after school to inform families or little snippets within our newsletters. Our monthly newsletters has um, a PBIS component to it. And then we also um, use social media as a platform to inform families of different things as well. So that is something that since we are so new that it, that is a goal for us moving forward. Okay, so what does the team see as their role for the upcoming school year in supporting all teachers in the building? Good question. Right? <laughs> so as a team supporting all teachers, we do a rollout before the school year starts and we have, as a district, one day a month we have a late start. So that's a good time for us to do some professional development and model it. We have really tried to, as building ISCs, go into classrooms if teachers would like us to come in there, or like I said before, welcoming in them in. Three of our ISCs were classroom teachers, so welcoming the other teachers into our classroom to observe if they would like to. Yeah, we also talked about really modeling this within our staff meetings, that as a start of our school climate committee, that maybe to start, we might start out with a celebration and everybody get in a circle and model what that might look like as well. But really, we're looking at building capacity within our staff. So we know time is tight and resources, there's all these competing resources and, and things that we need to get to, but trying to get creative with that, whether that be we're going to do some videos of these circles in action and sending that out to staff as well. And just to clarify, ISC is internal site coordinator, internal site coordinator which is a fancy word for PBIS coordinator or team member. Mm -hmm. Okay. wasn't necessarily an agenda. It was just a circle. So if I started in my question, you know, sometimes I would start with something easy like, what's your favorite color? And then they would just go around in the circle and share for that. So, and then sometimes, a lot of times it was something maybe we had going on. What are you excited about outside at recess? Just a few minutes. Maybe by the time we all sat and got going, 10 minutes tops with transitions. The question is, is responsive classroom part of your day as well? Which is another mm -hmm. a different type of program. No. Okay. Okay. 
thank you so much for the questions and the answers. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna leave a few minutes for uh, feedback. Um, we really appreciate your feedback from each session. The reason why we came back with this topic was because last year there was um, a high uh, feedback rate for the need. So please do uh, four ways to, to leave surveys. There's a paper survey, there's the app under feedback, and then there's also QR, QR code right here, and then there's a few in the hallway. So, um, and you may have noticed there's some prizes for leaving feedback as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Badger Elementary. Thank you all for coming today.